Hello and welcome to the 3D Blu-ray Bunker. This is a place for us die-hard fans of 3D where I look exclusively at 3D Blu-rays, not to do a movie review, but to focus almost entirely on the film's 3D, with uh, maybe just a short word at the end about the film itself. And this time I'm looking at one of, I think, the three 1980s Part 3 in 3D films, Jaws 3. Uh, it's got an aspect ratio of 2.39 to 1, and it was obviously filmed in 3D. I think it's generally accepted that there are three major eras of 3D movies. Uh, the Golden Age, spanning just a few short years from 1953, and the Silver Age, spanning the 1960s through to the uh, 1980s, and the modern digital age that lasted for about a decade. If I had to pick what I think of as the most iconic release from each of those eras, uh, the one which to my mind most captured public attention and encapsulated the style of 3D of its era, uh, I'd say that it has to be Avatar from the modern age, House of Wax from the golden age, and from the 1980s, Jaws 3. Um, so Avatar, for example, uses 3D mostly to emphasise depth, it has little obvious pop-out, and it's perhaps a little bit conservative in its 3D strength. House of Wax uses strong 3D, uh, it's happy to break out of the screen, uh, but it's maybe overall a bit more sophisticated in its use of 3D than modern audiences might expect it to be. Jaws 3 uses strong 3D, and like the 1980s themselves, it's maybe a bit over the top, a bit leery, and in your face. Something that most 3D films like to do is throw their title out at you, and Jaws 3 does it absolutely to the max. Uh, I've never actually done this before, but I paused the film right here and measured how far from my nose the logo appeared to be, and it was a fairly outrageous 18 inches, uh, and that means a massive amount of parallax. Um, but what they do here to help that work, uh, and they do it several times in the film with varying degrees of success, is to let the shot play out very slowly so that your eyes have time to adjust and cope with the extreme 3D on offer. By way of example, the severed head of the film's first shark victim uh, slowly floats closer and closer, moving to within the same sort of touching distance as the film's title. I love the way he's still trying to breathe here, it's a nice little touch. And a very similar and equally outrageously strong example comes in the form of the remains of uh, one of the human victims, again with a nice bit of attention to detail, this time in the protruding, um, is it ulna and radius bones? So this stuff is super strong, negative parallax 3D. Uh, in other words, the kind of thing that most anti-3D people would class as pure gimmickry. And to be fair to them, they do have a bit of a point, because these shots are, uh, for the most part, simply supposed to be 3D wow moments. And they not only have a limited amount to do with the storytelling, uh, but they tend to get in the way of it a bit, and look a little bit ridiculous if you're watching the film flat. Uh, now, I know it's supposed to be seen in 3D, but even then, I do find some of these shots slightly difficult to defend against accusations of being dimensionally vulgar. Uh, but at the same time, I also confess that I love them. It's also maybe a carryover from the style of 3D that Jaws used, that's why so many people today still think that this is what 3D is all about. They'll still assume that modern 3D films are concerned with this type of effect, uh, when in fact this sort of thing has been very rare during 3D's most recent boom. So those shots we've seen so far were carefully composed, uh, albeit maybe quaintly clunky, uh, optical effects shots um, where a lot of care could be given to getting the effect to work, even if it pushed at the boundaries of what the audience's eyes and brains could cope with, and they had the time to get it just right. Uh, there are several times, though, when they were shooting uh, on the fly and simply moved the camera in on the set with a lot less care and went in too close to various things so that they pushed beyond the limits of what can be seen in 3D. Um, so for example, the bubbles here are so different in the left and right eye views that there's no 3D effect, just a slightly awkward feeling. Uh, same goes for the blood here, which is also so close to the camera that there's no chance of it looking right. There might be rather too many examples of this, unfortunately, uh, including the reed here and the octopus's tentacle. I'm confident it's not just me, uh, but these shots simply don't work properly. And it always looks a little bit silly, uh, like the way the camera moves in on the serpent's head, and then the shot lingers on this irrelevant structure for far too long. And unlike those optically created body parts, this is far too strong to fuse together. Like I say, there are lots of these moments. Uh, aiming this dart gun at us is fine, uh, but then firing the bolt is a bit too much. And this is one of the film's less common, very brief attempts at pop-out. Uh, or the syringe here, as soon as 
as you see it, you think, uh, OK, I know what you're going to do. And when they oblige, it again makes for uh, a left and right eye view that are far too different to create any sense of 3D. There's a similar thing here. So the uh, whale is like that syringe in that it was a great 3D shot until they took it too far. Uh, all fine here and a nice bit of slow motion as it falls back into the water. But they hold the shot for too long so that when the water hits the camera, the 3D effect falls apart again. So I'd say something like maybe half of the extreme 3D shots in the film actually work, which in fairness is still quite a few and they really are incredibly strong. There are some other issues where it's not the extreme parallax that causes a problem, uh, but maybe the reflections, like the underwater light are here, where again the left and right eye views are completely different, so just don't work. It's not just parallax disparity where there are left and right eye conflicts. Uh, in quite a lot of the scenes, for some reason, the left eye view is sharper and less grainy than the right eye view. Uh, I'm normally a fan of film grain, and I really think it was the soul of film that's been snuffed out in recent years, uh, but when it's much more present in one eye than the other, then it's a bit of a distraction. So here, for example, there's much more detail in Simon McCorkindale's hair in the left eye view, and uh, Lou Gossett's head is far more grainy in the right eye view. The other real negative with this Blu-ray is the also frequent vertical misalignment. So in quite a lot of scenes, you might find that you're feeling a bit of eye strain and the 3D isn't all it should be, uh, like with the dolphin here. But if you tilt your head to the right a bit, uh, it looks much better. So it's again like those grainy right eye views, there are quite a lot of times in the film where the left and right eye views are misaligned. And this is something that I assume is more of a problem with the Blu-ray authoring rather than any baked-in issue, which, if that is the case, it's a shame that this release wasn't given better treatment. This release actually appears to be slightly ashamed of even being a 3D Blu-ray, um, with it not using the classic Jaws 3D logo on the cover. So I think the stuff I've mentioned so far are the things that this film and the Blu-ray release are most known for, uh, the extremely strong negative parallax, the too extreme negative parallax, uh, the overly grainy right eye view, and the vertical misalignment. Uh, but I do think that there's quite a bit more to Jaws 3 than its uh, notorious good, the bad, and the ugly elements. Firstly, I think most of the underwater photography is pretty good. Uh, it's nice and three-dimensional, this shot being nicely composed and uh, includes bubbles and rays of light in good 3D space. It's usually pretty clear and uh, overall quite impressive with the depth in the views over things like uh, coral and fish. Uh, or the classic Jaws point of view shot of potential victims. A minor thing that I liked a lot is the three-dimensional feel in this close-up view of the model of the film setting. Uh, it's both a nice bit of 3D as well as being a good visual exposition. And there's loads of what I think is great 3D composition throughout the whole film, uh, like these flags look nicely placed and are one of the film's many nice pieces of 3D that's not in-your-face obvious stuff. Uh, same with the posts on the beach here framing the characters. This is perfectly toned down and respectable 3D. Uh, same kind of thing with the awnings on the beach here. It's just a nice use of composition across the z-axis. These pipes too are a great location for the 3D to shine in. So this isn't about poking you in the eye, it's just about 3D bringing out detail in structures in a way that 2D doesn't. Maybe the best example of that is amongst the uh, coral here. This is the same sort of thing that you see with foliage, where the shot in 2D can almost be a meaningless mess. But in 3D, views like this make immediate spatial sense, and you understand the view in a far more detailed way than you can when it's flat. Uh, speaking of flat, I'll just throw in another criticism, even if it's one that's minor to the point of irrelevance. Uh, but if you've seen any of my other videos, you'll know that I'm at my most obsessive when it comes to binoculars. Uh, so here's Lou Gossett using a pair, and the view we get through them is one of the most cretinously created binocular shots I've ever seen. Uh, the daft twin circles here are so far apart that the way they're joined is patently absurd. And not only that, but what should be a hyperstereo view is actually completely flat. Uh, to their credit though, I think this is the only 2D shot in the whole film, which is pretty impressive when you think of everything that can go wrong when shooting in stereo, uh, especially underwater and with no option of post-conversion back then. So I mentioned that I think the 3D in the film is well representative of the 1980s, and so's the girl here. I don't think she could look much more 80s if she was um, dressed up as Boy George. Uh, there's a nice composition in the bar here again, as she walks past those nets though, and I'm assuming that there was some fun and considered 3D direction from Joe Alves. Um, when she gets to the table, they all start raising their arms into 3D space in a way that I find quite amusing. It happens again later when they all raise their arms to point at one of them, and I'm going to assume that this was done to make the most of 3D space. 
There are lots of scenes with water ski people doing their thing. Uh, it's a nice enough 3D composition and made all the better by including these long trailing flags. Uh, although then they couldn't quite resist the temptation to go in close on the flags to give us another out of place shot because it offered a strong pop out opportunity. Uh, when I recently looked at Universal Soldier, I mentioned that the uh, Mustang Ford might be the car to have made the most appearances across 3D cinema, and I forgot about the one that turns up here. Something that might be worth mentioning on a personal note is that this was the first 3D film that I ever went to see at the cinema. Uh, for me, it was a special trip to London's Leicester Square, and uh, needless to say, I thought it was incredible, and I was hooked for life. Uh, but what really affected me, and I don't know how much of an admission this is, but it wasn't the audacious, obtrusive, and conspicuous intrusions deep into negative parallax, but it was this shot this exact moment. I remember it very distinctly. So it's 1983 and I'm an extremely non-worldly 15 year old innocent who's never been anywhere near an attractive woman in his life. And to my adolescent and impressionable mind, it was seeing the volume and shape of Leah Thompson's very cute character brought into a new reality by the 3D that was the absolute revelation of the day. A kind of epiphany that stirred something within me. Uh, anyway, before I get overly confessional, uh, I think that's more than enough about that. Uh, so where was I? Great composition, I think. Um, for example, the depth and separation that's in these crowd shots is fantastic, with everyone in their own space, as you'd expect them to be. And the 3D composition is rock solid here too, with Simon McCorkendale being framed within the gap in the crowd. There's so much of this non-obvious but very nice uh, stuff, like the uh, beam of the torchlight in 3D space, uh, or the almost always lovely view of a surface stretching deep into the screen. And whereas some of the shots of bubbles are a bit too close for comfort, there are others like these that look superb in 3D. And bubbles often work so well because there are so many of them uh, in a load of different 3D space, similar to the sparks flying around here. Uh, lots of detail across 3D space, and uh, these look excellent too. There is actually another negative that I haven't mentioned, and that's the mostly quite poor optical effects work. It's often rather substandard, the nasty black lines around things looking quite low rent, especially when it's the film's main character in this, uh, I think, infamously bad shot. And the final shot of the film is a horrible optical mess with the uh, dolphins on either side looking terrible. Uh, they're in the wrong 3D space with the wrong lighting, and they just look atrocious, partly because they just use one and mirror it. It, which looks incredibly cheap and stupid. Uh, it's one of the worst final shots in a film I can think of. But back to the positives, and to uh, really ram home my point, whilst that floating fish head and the uh, severed arm are amongst the most exuberant pieces of 3D pop-out you'll ever see, uh, they're not my favourite moments of 3D in the film. Because for me, it's this shot, uh, which I absolutely love. It looks to me like a genuine shot rather than using any optical or other effects trickery. And it's awesome as uh, McCorkindale's reflection sits right alongside the same 3D space as the shark behind the glass. So it's a piece of three-dimensional foreshadowing and I think it's an incredibly classy and creative use of 3D. So just a very quick word about the film itself, uh, Jaws is one of my all-time favourite films, and I don't really regard this film as having anything to do with the 1975 classic. It uses Chief Brody's kids, now grown up, uh, as characters, but apart from that and the presence of a shark, this has no DNA in common with Spielberg's masterpiece. Uh, it was Jaws 2 rather than this film that I think first led to that phenomena that makes many people's skin crawl of referring to an immeasurably superior first film, as is the case here, as Jaws 1, uh, which is just nasty, and uh, I suspect Jaws 3 exacerbated that problem. It's a real shame to see the brilliant author Richard Matheson end up as one of the credited writers, and I'm sure that whatever script he turned in was far better than the one they filmed, and really, it is all a bit weak and uninteresting. There's maybe a little bit of character here and there, I suppose, and it's good to see a young uh, Dennis Quaid, but the whole thing felt fairly uninvolving to me. It's always a bad sign when the extras supposedly in peril look like they're laughing, which seems to be the case once or twice. There's the dodgy special effects as well, and keep in mind that this is not only not 
pre-Star Wars, but it came out the same year as Return of the Jedi, uh, so it might have been fair to expect some less shoddy effects work. In spite of all that, I do find it quite watchable, as well as being a significant piece of nostalgia for me, and uh, throw in some ludicrously overt 3D, and despite it being a bit rubbish as a film, I think at the same time it manages to be an essential addition to any 3D Blu-ray collection. So I hope you found this in some way useful, and if so, I hope you'll join me again soon for another 3D Blu-ray review. Until then, thanks for looking in on this one, cheers for now, bye bye.